Welcome, Dr. Gali, and welcome. Thank everyone. you. Very happy to have you here. I think very happy to be here. Thank you. Uh, I think people will keep trickling in, but maybe as they do, I will start to introduce you because it's there's so much to say. Oh my! <laughs> so, um, welcome to the second program this spring of the Modern Tibetan Studies Program at Columbia University. Our guest speaker, Dr. Lucia Gali, earned her PhD in Oriental Studies at the University of Oxford. Her talk today draws on her fascinating dissertation research on a wealthy Kampa trader and Tsongpun, uh, Kat, uh, Katak uh, Zamyak, and his travels through Tibet, Nepal, and India from 1944 to 1956. Dr. Gali is also the author or editor of several important studies on Tibetan life writing and selfhood, as well as the intersection of economic and social status in Tibetan communities, including the, the life of a muleteer, which is going to be coming out uh, in uh, later, maybe later this spring. <laughs> we hope. Hopefully, we don't know, <laughs> but very Vajra, soon. <laughs> Vajra publications in, in Kathmandu. So um, it's particularly exciting to have these figures represented from, as, as, the, as the Europeans have called it, uh, people who've escaped, Tibetans who've escaped the historian's net, right? These people who are not aristocrats, not llamas, but merchants and muleteers, people like that. It's really important to, to have these life stories represented. Um, uh, attendees are referred to the new volume that uh, she co-edited with Franz Xavier Erhard, The Selfless Ego, published by Rutledge in 2021. Um, from 2017 to 2020, Dr. Gali was a research fellow at the Center uh, Centre de Recherche sur les civilisations de l'Asie Orientale, East Asian Civilizations Research Center, under the supervision of the Ecole Pratique des Hautes Etudes, uh, the Collège de France, and the University of Paris. Um, and she's currently a member uh, right here in New Jersey, where we're both presenting from today at the School of Historical Studies at the Institute for Advanced Studies in Princeton. Uh, COVID restrictions made it difficult to host Dr. Kali on campus here at Columbia, but we are anyway very happy that her talk is more widely accessible on this Zoom webinar today. We thank Dr. Gali for generously agreeing to present her work, and we thank the Weatherhead East Asian Institute and our PhD student, Constantine Lignos, for their help in publicizing today's event. Dr. Gali will speak for about 50 minutes, and then we'll open up for questions, um, and attendees can type the questions below in the Q&A box, please, and these will be visible only to Lucia and myself as the moderator, so I'll, I'll help. Uh, moderate those when the time comes. But in the meantime, I turn it over to Dr. Gali and thank you again. Thank you so much, Gray, for such a kind introduction. And thank you to you and Laura for inviting me today and you know, giving me the chance to talk about a topic that is quite close and dear to my heart. Um, I also would like to thank the Friends of the Institute for their general sponsorship uh, that allowed me to be here today in Princeton, spending a wonderful academic year in a very conducive environment, and also to share, if not the same physical space with you guys in Colombia, at least the same time zone. So let me just start by sharing my screen. Um, here we are. Okay, so as Gray mentioned, today's talk is largely based on my DPhil present uh, dissertation, and it's centered around what I consider to be a very fascinating text, more specifically, the diary or the journal or the annotations. I mean, <laughs> the terminology here varies a lot of the 20th century Eastern Tibetan, uh, sorry, Eastern Tibetan trader named Katak Zamyak. Now, when um, I start talking with Lauren about the topic and in the days you know, that preceded this presentation today, she uh, said that there, there was quite an interest for, for the event. And I was not particularly surprised. And, and this is not because I'm uber confident in my oratory skills, far from it. Rather, I believe that the topic itself has a certain you know, pull in traction. And if I had the chance to talk to each one of you today before the talk and ask you what kind of expectation you have in terms of the, the, the text that we were dealing with, 
I'm pretty sure that the kind of answers that I will receive will fall within you know, certain lines like a first person narrative, a dated account, and possibly you know, a confidential content, some kind of personal um, taste to the narrative. And that is because everyone who is exposed since childhood to text develops in the course of the years a sort of you know, intuitive taxonomic ability to place a text within a certain category. And so when we hear the term diary, we immediately have certain expectations in mind in terms of the feature that the text should have. Um, the problem with this kind of you know, intuitive taxonomic ability is the fact that when we are faced with a textual product that comes from a different cultural environment, our expectations are challenged. And that is what will happen to us when we start digging into this kind of text today. So certain things will certainly be familiar to you and others will probably not be so much so. Um, so to give you an idea of how I will proceed with this, um, I will uh, uh, first of all outline the function and the structure of the genre, provided that we can talk about, you know, uh, the aristic genre, the aristic genre in uh, the Tibetan literary corpus. So to provide you with a sort of theoretical background against which to read Zamyag's annotation, and I will then proceed to dissect the content on the Nintep itself to flesh out the figure of its author, and so recreate a journey that is both physical and spiritual. I believe that most of you are um, familiar with uh, the Tibetan literary corpus uh, and know firsthand that a massive part of it is constituted by what we could define as life writing, which is um, an umbrella term that includes different literary genres, uh, among which you know, pride of place is taken by the namta, the biographies, or also um, known as hagiographies, followed by the rangnam, so the our autobiographies. And then we have a lot of other kinds of texts that are biographical in nature, such as the Tokjo, or um, that can be um, from which uh, sorts of biographical information can be extrapolated. And we have then the records of teaching received, such as the Senik or Tobik, the treasure text, the Terma, the legal documents, such as the contract, the, Gange, the Gengia, the correspondence, the songs, and finally, the diaries or journals the Nintep, Ninto. Um, I would say that the terminology itself, as I mentioned at the very beginning of, of my presentation, is quite complicated. The term Ninto um, appears in traditional text to indicate a list of days um, with a very functional um, character and feature. As for the Nintep, is a more colloquial term, so you will not find it within traditional text. It indicates a book in terms of a Western book that uh, contains annotation regarding, say, day, days. Um, the interesting thing is that uh, although labeled as a Nintep, the annotation of Katag Damyak do, do not contain um, the term Nintep. So Damyak never uses the term to refer to his own textual production. And the reason for this uh, will be elucidated later on in, in my talk, and I will explain you why. As ever, though, the best place to start is the beginning. And in tracing the, gen the genesis of the diaristic genre and its complex position within what we could define as the Namtar matrix or the Namtar narrative, I cannot but refer to Janet Gyatso's groundbreaking study of Chikme Limpa's autobiographies as they appear in Apparitions of the Self, um, published in 1998. By stressing how, and I'm here quoting, the life writing impulse in Tibet reflects a long tradition of record keeping, Janet Gyatso brings to the fore her discussion on Rangnam, so on autobiographical writing, the correlation between autobiographical narrative and factual annotation. The fifth Dalai Lama Nawan Lutzang Yatso, the eighth Situ Panchen Chu Kin Jingne, and the third tone Jingme Limpa all uh, kept diaries upon which their biographies or autobiographies were composed. And this is, I believe, a fruitful example of intertextual dialogues among ego documents. And the term ego documents was coined by the Dutch historian Jacques Brasseur to indicate, and I'm here quoting, those documents in which an ego intentionally or unintentionally discloses or hides itself. 
And this idea of intertextuality will appear again and again also in the case of Zamyak Smintep. He will continue to do you know, references to notes that he wrote himself, books that he read, um, things that he heard. And this is really uh, an embedding process that tells us a lot about the importance of culture when we examine uh, literary products. The presence of a compiler of an editor is not an unusual factor in what is the creative process at the base of many Tibetan autobiographical writings. In the aforementioned case of the Situs Diaries, for instance, the narrative was edited and arranged by one of his disciples, Belutsewan Kunkyap, who took upon himself the task of ordering the random notes contained in his master's year's book. Similarly, the diaries of the 39th Sakya Trinchen, Drakshil Trinle Rinchen, were just odd annotated scripts of papers, some of which even dated back to the master's childhood, were collected and pierced together by his chief disciple, Jampel Zangpo. So we see there is uh, a third party massively involved in this, in this production. And the editing of a personal diary may appear in contrast with, with what is our intuitive literary knowledge as readers. And I, I mentioned you before, we carry with us this sort of expectation of what a text should be like and how it gets to be the way it is. That not always you know, can hold up against other uh, texts that are produced in a completely different environment. Whereas in fact, the presence of narrativization, selection, expansion, omission, and the compilation of an autobiography understood as the tale of how the narrating I came to be may be somewhat tolerated as long as the truth that is at the core of it remains somewhat untampered. The rawness of the diary that is virtually synchronic to the events recorded is conceived as requiring little to non-polishing effort. So it seems counterintuitive to have someone who, you know, select entries and piece them together and give, give them a structure. Now, a reader's expectation notwithstanding, rarely a personal record is as simple as that. Even the seal of authenticity is at the end, the mere outcome of stylistic feature that are exercised within the genre as a whole. The style of Situ's diary is to say that Jim Smith, who created uh, the editing um, version of them, is very terse. His human persona is rarely hinted at. The fact that the self-indulgent attitude of the modern diaries, what we come to expect, finds no equivalent in the traditional form of daily annotation is hardly surprising for actions, events, and relationship where uh, the only elements considered worthy of being recorded. The bare bone minimalism of Situ's entry was the outcome of an, a deliberate process of selection. Meant to function as a sort of red thread in the author's memory, the notes also reflect what is the cultural and socio-historical forces shaping their creator's self-identity. Throughout his life, in fact, the eighth Situ uh, encouraged the systematic study of Sanskrit and invested himself in projects aimed at examining and revising the existing translation of Sanskrit Shastras at the core of the Tibeta, Tibetan theological studies. And the fact that his, his entries reflect this interest, this lifelong commitment, bears testimony not only to this author's passion, but also his desire to locate himself within a specific tradition that is the tradition of the Lotsawa, the translators. And so we see his. Um, recollections and his annotation and, and the fact that he put so much emphasis on this side of his life allows him to morph his persona on an ideal concept of personhood that is transmitted and made culturally available and acceptable by the tradition. And this is an element that we'll see is constant and I would say owns much to this idea of the Namta Narati, an overarching you know, matrix that somewhat encompass all the kind of life writing production in Tibet. And also we'll see it later on in uh, uh, the Nindeb or Katak Tanyak. The telegraphic character of pre-modern Tibetan diaries, of which Situ's entries are just for one example, appears to support the claim of Philippe Lejeune, uh, a French scholar who dedicated much of his life studying the diaristic genre, in claiming that this sort of genre was born of the needs of commerce and administration. So the functional role of the diary is akin, we can say, to that of a ledger, namely keeping track of transactions, be they economic or personal nature, by dating them. 
But the long traditional record keeping fueled the Tibetan life writing impulse to say it with Gyatso, and that the relation between Namta, Rangnam, and other forms of biographical writing is almost an inescapable one, is a fact that is acknowledged by the fifth Dalai Lama himself, who in his Rangnam supported the interchangeability in all intents and purposes of autobiographies and lists of teachings, the top week or sen week. And I'm here quoting from uh, the autobiography of the fifth. I don't have a namcha to write that could be beneficial to others. At the moment, a topic is being written and that has the same purpose of a namcha. So again, the idea that a life of an individual must be um, uh, pushed towards a source of model. There must be some sort of didactic educational purpose behind it to be worth of recording. And so in this case, the fact that I'm taking, you know, teachings from specific masters that I'm placing myself within a specific genealogy of teaching teachers is enough to you know give sense and purpose to my life you don't need to know about anything else the reluctance shows by the great fifth of being involved in the writing of an autobiography complies to what is the normative Tibetan view of an individual self as is explained by the Nawang Lubzang Yatsu himself and I'm here quoting again Namta are meant to express the likeness of the great saints. There is no need to write the various activities caused in my life by the known virtuous three poisons, so that to make public that I did not have the fortune of entering the preparatory path of the bodhisattvas, let alone gaining the Buddhist quality of those great ones. Such a namta will not satisfy the learned ones. So characterized by self-disparagement and claims to humility, Tibetan autobiography actually owns its own existence to the prompting of others. In the light of this, the recording of one's life becomes a socially validated act, sanctioned as beneficial to the community in its entirety. And this idea of a benefit for everybody else is um, kept also in, in, in the diaries, um, in the diary genre, as we shall see uh, in a moment. That biographical writing in all forms absorbs some sort of di didactic and educational purpose and is therefore not a product to be solely enjoyed by this author, affects even what is envisioned, at least to our understanding, as the most exclusive of such textual productions. In pre-modern Tibet, in fact, diaries of religious masters and lay officials were often kept by third parties, such as secretaries and disciples, and were therefore far from being a completely private matter. As Rudolf Decker, and I'm sorry if I will keep back to this, you know, literary theorist and, and expert in narratology, but this is the kind of approach that I use in dealing with uh, the Nindab. Uh, he observes, a point of current interest is the question to what extent ego documents were of a private nature and whether the authors had a certain audience in mind. I would argue that in the case of traditional Tibetan diaries, the writer rarely writes exclusively for their own eyes. Rather, personal annotation of relevant events contributed to the creation of a common memory and identity, be they those of a monastery, of a labrang, of a religious community, or of a private family unit. Rather than a spontaneous act or a romantic outpour of the soul as we usually conceive diaries to be, traditional Tibetan diaries were a functional list of facts and experiences. Traditional Tibetan diary is certainly subjective, but it strives towards the creation of what we could define as a modal subject in compliance with the customary views of the self. The editing process undergone by traditional Tibetan diaries should also be recalled. The reader has access not to the original entries, but to revised versions of them, whether framed as a proper namta, as was the case for the fifth Dalai Lamas, or simple autobiographical text edited by third parties, as it was the case for the uh, 39 Sake Trinchen Tukju the life story of the 39th Sakya. In her study of Tibetan diary practice, and I'll come back again to Janet Gyatso, she remarks about her informant's reluctance to admit their engaging in diary writing, an embarrassment even the more evident in the case of ordained interviewees. The recording of worldly experiences is considered, and I'm here quoting, meaningless, misleading, and even harmful from a Buddhist perspective. I believe the latter, Painful at odds with what is the Tibetan Peshan for keeping detailed records. Whereas writing about mundane events was to be done carefully and in the most detached way, the compilation of notes on meditative achievements was encouraged, provided they were authentic. 
Now, the question of authenticity or bona fide brings to the fore the issues of truthfulness and therefore factuality that is at the core of the diary sick genre. Readings of sorry, recordings of supernatural events such as magical apparitions, prophetic dreams, and so on abound in diaries of Tibetan religious figures. Yet their apparent fictionality in our, in our eyes, but I would say that fictionality here is meant as meta-realism, like what goes beyond what is the usual experience of a subject, must be disregarded in the light of the function that they play within the tradition. These events are deemed real and authentic by the author at the time of their happening and recorded as such in their writing. So far from being ontological categories as we will take them, fact and fiction change in relation to the embedding sociocultural and literary milieu. From a Buddhist perspective, in fact, visions, apparitions, and magical displays are not fictitious elements, but rather true events, far more valuable than facts, such as individual triumphs and failures. So it is amid this reflection on the development of the Tibetan diary genre uh, in its form and practice and how it relates to this kind of overarching Namtar uh, matrix. And so discussion of tradition against modernity, factors against fiction, private against public, that I need to place the work of Kathak Tanyak. And I believe this stand up as an epitome of the hybridity of the genre. So autobiographical writing of an otherwise unknown Kampa trader, the text spans from 1944 to 1956, a period that was mainly spent by the author journeying, pilgrimaging, and trading. Samyak was born in 1896 in Rabshi, that you see here in a purple square, in Ga, one of the areas of the Nanchen kingdom. He was the youngest of seven siblings, three sons and four daughters. In accordance with the Tusi system that was in force in, uh, in the region, the administrative and juridical power was in the hands of local officials, most of whom were indigenous leaders, the highest titles of whom ranked from Chanhu, uh, which was identified with the king of Nanchen, to the Behu, to the Beichang. The Kata Gentop clan, and I'm here very mindful of using such a loaded term, but just to give you an idea of what I'm talking about. The Kata Gentop clan, to which Zamyak's family belonged, is listed among the Beichang of the Rabshi, so the lords of what are considered to be the 50 households. And its village counted 140 families and 563 people, so numbers that made it one of the biggest territorial entities under the Rabshi Behu. As the youngest among his siblings, Zamyak entered as a child the local Gelu monastery of Lungung and then took to Chukulin, where he worked and he lived for several decades. As for his immediate family, we know that one of his sisters was a nun and that he had two nephews from another sister, or possibly two, we don't know, as it's not clear where Lobzang Zamyang and Tekcho Tapche, um, the two uh, uh, nephews, were brothers or cousins. Although Tekto uh, sorry, Tekcho Tapke is introducing the Nindev as the Sapo Chewa, the eldest nephew. It is Lobjong who recurs more frequent, frequently in the narrative as the main assistant and business partner of Zamyak. The Nindev opens on the fifth month of the monkey year, so in June 1944, with the author's decision to depart from the local Gelu monastery of Lungun and set off on a pilgrimage without any fixed destination. Thus, following what it was the idea of a wandering pilgrim that had in Milarepa, uh, the 11th century uh, yogin, its finest representative. The motivation behind what turned out to be a lifelong exile must be sought in a series of misfortunes that befell Zamyag in 1940, when it was involved in a feud between representatives of the local ruling house of Rapshi and some of the majors of the reincarnation of Lungen. Accuses others of having murdered the ruler's hair, our author was imprisoned, bitten, and put under trial, and only to be released a year later in 1941. No cogent proof were moved against him, and his name, though, was never really cleared, and his property were forfeit, and he found himself, by his own words, as a new beggar, as a sartrum. Before leaving the monastery of Lungen, Zamyang sought teaching from Tempe Nyingpo, a visiting reincarnation for Kyotrak, a Barun Kagyu monastery located in Nangchen. And I would like to draw attention to uh, the kind of um, intersectarian uh, relationship uh, that Zamyang 
entertained throughout his life. He, you know, was enrolled, he enrolled into Agilu Monastery. He received Agilu uh, education, but he was very open as many others in the region to Rime um, attitude. So he pursued teachings from uh, Kagyu masters, uh, and he was very close to uh, the Sakya environment, as we can see later on when he will join Nungore Wanchoden, a Sakya establishment in uh, near Shigatsu. So Tempe Ningpo imparted him um, uh, lifelong empowerment, but also reported a vision that he had regarding the trader's immediate future. And I'm here quoting from the, di the diary. Not long from now, after the 10th day of the 10th month of the monkey year, so on 25th of November, 1944, without delay, go on a pilgrimage without a specific direction. Whether it is central Tibet or Mount Kailash, it will be good for both your present and future life. Interestingly, the motivation behind Zamiak's travels though change with time. And we can see here um, in the map is um, movement. Uh, throughout you know, the, the years that follow his departure. At the very beginning, he decided to remain close by and he visited going back and forth Jekundo and Bege. The reason why he did not depart uh, despite you know, the vision of uh, uh, Tempe Ningpo was because he still believed there was a possibility for him to reconcile with the Lord of Rabshi. He really believed in, in his innocence and he thought that the Lord sooner or later will, you know, uh, cleanse his name and, and cleanse his name and just allow him to resume his position. Unfortunately, that was not the case. And in 1945, rumors had it that uh, he received threat to his life and he decided that it was really time to leave behind his um, payu. And he headed towards Lhasa, of course, as many other pilgrims, and he traveled through Nakchu to Lhasa. Uh, he spent um, different, uh, quite an amount of time in Lhasa, uh, rekindling some relationship that he had in the place. And then he decided to move towards Shigatse. And after he moved towards Shigatse, he uh, located himself in uh, one of the houses of the Sadutsang because he was one of the traders uh, for uh, the Sadutsang. And from there, he departed in a series of pilgrimages, um, home business trips, as we shall see, going towards Nari, so visiting Mount, Mount Kailash and Lake Manasarovar, and then uh, towards the south, uh, going to India, and also to Nepal. Now, let's go to the real thing, uh, the work. And I'm sure you will be quite surprised to see that it's an edited book. And I was surprised myself, I must say. Uh, during my doctoral uh, period, I was uh, convinced that I could get my hands on the manuscripts that are um, you know, preserved in the Tibet house in Delhi, but that was not the case. And as many of you are aware, when you are doing a doctorate, there are time and financial constraints. And so you really need to uh, decide what to do um, pretty early on. And I decided to do with what I had. And what I had was a wonderful edited book. And, uh, um, as you can see, the, edited, the book was edited by the Tibet House and then was published in 1997, an occasion of the centenary from uh, you know, Katag's birth um, by the Inda Prashta Press. And of course, having to deal with an edited text um, presented uh, all sorts of um, issues and, and difficulties. And I resorted to what and you have some correctly said, and that is, uh, I'm quoting, publication alters the status of the work, the diary, in the same way as it does, say, a novel. What the publication of a diary does mean is that the diary can now be subjected to the same types of scrutiny as applied to the novel, both as a literary object and as an object of social history. And this is exactly what I did. And this is why I keep recurring, you know, to um, going back to narrative uh, narratology and uh, literary theorists it's just because this is the way I approach the text. We know that since the 1960, writing projects in the diaspora in India began to concentrate on the editing and publication of personal narratives and private documents for preservation purposes. It was the potential benefit for the community at large that motivated and we may add justified from the traditional point of view 
Samyak's family's decision to turn pub public what was, after all, a private manuscript, as it is explained by um, Samyak's nephew in the foreword to the Ninja, and I'm here quoting. One needs to assume any account as being true and reliable, whether it be a statement based on what one has actually witnessed, or be it oral narratives of others, so long as they are not compromised by political considerations. Therefore, these diary entries are published here with in the hope that they might be of some benefit to readers. I had lovingly preserved the paper scroll of the meticulous diary entries of my kind maternal uncle, Katak Zamyak, who recorded what he saw, heard, and understood during the course of his pilgrimages to holy places in Tibet, India, and Nepal over a period of 13 years. Once I happened to show these diaries to Dubum Rinpoche, the director of the Tibet House in New Delhi, and he said that since these diary entries contain a wealth of eyewitness accounts and oral narratives, it would certainly be of value and benefit if these could be properly edited and published. And I would say, again, we find the Namta narrative, you know, the prompting uh, by others to publish, the self-effacing na narrative of the self that doesn't believe that his own, you know, life is worth recording, and then the prompting of others. Now, from a Western perspective, the editing process is a delicate one and it's often regarded with suspicion. The editor is considered responsible for the violation of what the literary theorists define the secrecy clause, as the text is meant for specific addressees, be they the authors themselves or their family, such a text is suddenly available to anyone. The filling of gaps and the reconstruction of the original context comes with a price. Without the original manuscript to rely on, one is forced to believe whatever the editor saw fit to include in the narrative, thus leaving the reader inevitably unaware of any omission, censorship, or paraphrasing. Nevertheless, we have seen how traditional Tibetan Ninto were commonly edited by disciples and secretaries, and are therefore several authorized addressees. The secrecy clause, if such a term could be used in relation to Tibetan, uh, traditional Tibetan Ninto, regarding the suitability of the content against the potential reader. This is particularly true in the case of diary entries at the core of the Sangwe Namta, the secret autobiographies, whereas via discretion is advised in consideration of spiritual advancement of the reader, rather than as an attempt to protect the author's privacy. That was the case, for instance, of the record of visionary experiences kept by the fifth Dalai Lama, which was accessible only to few selected addressees, mainly close disciples and religious artists. The didactic and educational character underpinning most of Tibetan forms of life writing affects Tibetan diary keeping practices as well. The loose secrecy clause, or to use um, Jean Rousset terminology, the degree of openness of the text makes possible the fruition of the Ninto, Ninte, to a wide range of legitimate addresses. At the beginning of his first person narration of past events recorded in a diary format, and this is really I believe the right way to address this kind and, and define this kind of text. The next identified the desires to preserve their memory as the main motivation for his writing. And I'm here quoting again. I'm, I'm sorry, the, the quotation that you see, the block quotes are really a shortened version of what I'm gonna read. As for me, I'm the one known by the affectionate name of Samyak and the Dharma name of Nawang Dage, the one continuously disturbed by mental afflictions. I was born at the center of the region called Rapshi, considered to be part of Ga, Kam. Up to the age of 49, I went through success and failure, happiness and sadness, sometimes with and sometimes without, the disposition and capacity to dedicate myself to the Dharma. Had I to write all the things that happened to me, it would be endless, right, ripples of water. As for these events, some raise compassion, some inspire renunciation, some fall into the category of wrongdoings, and others are humorous, but since there are too many of them, they will not be the focus of my writing. When I was 49, due to a series of circumstances, I wandered through the three provinces of Tibet, alone, without a lord to protect me, relying on the support of my co-regionals. I shall therefore write a little about the circumambulation and visits I paid to extraordinary places and the three supports so as to keep them in my mind. Although never meant to be published, the Nintep is structured in such a way to be accessible and understandable to selected addresses, such as the author extended family, with the intention to provide a useful account of experiences and events. The scroll papers that have been lovingly preserved by Zamyak's nephew, Lo Jong, offer a glimpse to the sort of private archives upon which common family identity is constructed. 
as Arian Bagaman fittingly recommends, and I'm here quoting, maybe we ought to start not by addressing the question why people wrote ego document in the past, but by answering the question why they did not throw them away. I previously referred to the Nintab as a first person narration of past events in a diary format, a work that places itself along the line of traditional Tibetan Ninto, imaginarily fits within the literary standards of the Western diary genre. Private record of life process rather than the finished narrative about life, the Nintab's nature is analytical, to borrow Lejeune's words, in that it explains situation in such a way that it can be understood by oneself later on. But it's not confessional, and this is a feature that we would expect from diary, since it does not put in the foreground the impulses of the soul. It has been said that Zamiak's account records the author's life process, but it does so in a sort of retrospective manner. Whereas most Western diaries are composed by the subject while their life is happening and are therefore first and foremost an activity, a way of living before being a way of writing, the Nindap is clearly a recollection of events. There is a certain distance in time and space between the narrating self and the narrated self. Furthermore, the author rely on others to have produced extra sources, as I mentioned beforehand, such as personal notes, ledgers, and private letters that help him to reconstruct the past. The rhythm of the narrative fluctuates. Gaps of day and weeks may replace daily descriptions, and the system is that of a chronicle or an account book where the only date that counts is the date of the reported event rather than the date of the writing. It is therefore not unusual that an enumeration of days follows a specific date, as if the author's memory worked backwards from a memorable event up to another, filling the time between the two with an enumeration of toponyms, people, and you know, exchanges in a mental reconstruction of what was a physical journey. It is vital to stress how the events reported into the Nindep were not recorded in the moment, but rather recollected and narrativized at a later time. The narrative process is, in its own nature, constructive and imaginative. Albeit restrained by moral concern for truthfulness, any autobiographical text that is based on one's own memory is somewhat crafted and arbitrary. That being said, though, I would say that it's also undeniable the life itself as a sort of inherent structure. In order to have experiences, one should have them one at a time, and life is not a random cluster of occurrences with no relation to one another. Rather, each happenings find its focus of attraction in the experienced subject, which orders them in a chronological sequence and place them in a context that makes sense and gives meaning to their own life in its entirety. Those experiences are intrinsically narratological and depend upon temporality as well as the cultural, social, and historical condition in which the subject lives. In Zamiak's case, the evaluation aspect, that is to say the task, the task of placing sequential events in terms of a meaningful context is fulfilled through his self-identification with the figure of the 11th century in Tibetan yogin Milarepa, and I mentioned that beforehand. And this is very much um, explicit in the Nindab, as we shall see. Because the Lord of Rapshi expropriated all of Katak Zamiak's wealth, and sometimes he refers to himself in the third person, so that's not concerning. Just like in the past, Milarepa was robbed of his heritage by his paternal uncle and aunt, I, Katak Zamiak, could not stay in my homeland and wander to the borders. Having wandered to the borders, I reached the central province of U, and even though I had, an, I had to be undercover by keeping a low profile, my eyes could see far and wide. Having abandoned the hope to return to my fatherland, I obtained peace of mind. Having circumambulated the supports and sacred places of the four regions of central Tibet, and pay homage to the two forms of Buddha Sakyamuni in Lhasa, I dedicated the prayer out of equanimity and compassion to all sentient beings, whether enemies, friends, or people having neutral disposition towards me. As we shall see, Zamiak follows the sinner becomes, becomes saint scheme that is at the core of the most popular version of the life story of the saint that was composed in the 15th century by Tsangyong Eruka. The trader, as we have seen, feels a strong affiliation with Milarepa, as the latter is suffered oppression, was forced to leave his ancestral land, to embark on a pilgrimage without any fixed direction. And his narrative repeatedly hints at the author's desire to cleanse his karma, thus conforming to the powerful paradigm that Milarepa's namta had become for many generations of Tibetans. 
Intertextuality plays a fundamental role in the NINTEP, and I would say, generally speaking, in many of uh, the biographical writing belonging to the Tibetan literary corpus. And it cannot be otherwise, since no text is produced in a literary void. As a matter of fact, the presence of what Sidon Smith defines as ideological I, that is to say, the concept of personhood culturally available to the narrator when he tells the story, is particularly relevant to our discussion. For the ideological eye not only reflects the social, the social and intertextual embedding of Tamiyak's narrative, but also reveals the way in which traditional structures and institutional self-representation, so ideas of personhood, of how somebody should behave and, and, and should behave and act, are actively engaged and reinterpreted throughout uh, a literary production such as is the Ninda. In his account, Zamyak amply draws from a pool of cultural interpretation and traditional literature, his desire to follow the steps of the enlightened renunciate hampered by the necessity of accommodating unavoidable material needs. In discussing Western autobiographical narrative, Jérôme Brunet draws attention to the marking of those episodes in the narrator life that leads to decisive changes in a particular belief, conviction, or situation, and calls them turning points. These are understood by the scholars as features, and I'm here quoting, crucial to the efforts to individualize a life, to make it clearly and patently something more than a running off automatic folk psychological canonicality. This is a very complicated sentence to uh, indicate that what the turning points show is the desire of the individual to diverge for the mainstream um, idea of personhood. So the desire to disengage from what is expected from him or her and become his own person. I would like to argue that in the Ninta, the function performed by the marking of these turning points, these pivotal uh, moments in the narrative is, oppo is opposite to the one described by Brunner, since it invariably reconciles Damiak's narration to the traditional life story that he has chosen as an ideal model, in this case, Milarepa's Namta. So, Far from being an attempt to detach himself, to individualize himself, these turning points show the desire of Zamiags to conform, to become as close as possible to the kind of person he desires to be. Um, it is in fact the human need to narrate one's own existence, I would say, thus giving it a retrospective shape and meaning that calls for the recourse to socially and culturally validated and acceptable storylines and discourses appropriately adapted to one's own situation. But what was exactly Zamyak's situation? To answer this question, we must necessarily turn to the content of the Ninta, the main narrative that runs almost uninterrupted from 1944 to 1956, deals extensively with pilgrimages and ritual activities performed both inside and outside the Tibetan plateau. Although filled with notes of religious visits and offerings, the narrative presents an inner dichotomy that extends beyond the apparent geographic rational to a more subtle and intimate reason. So the two sites that emerge in Zamyak's account, Tibet proper on one hand and the holy lands of India and Nepal on the other, cannot but reflect the inner changes of the author, who gradually morphs, as we shall see in a moment, from a beggar, a chung, ousted from his ancestral land to a financial insured trading agent, a thonton. The pilgrimages and ritual activities carried out by Zamyaks within the Tibetan plateau are patently different in their form and aim from those performed at the sacred sites of India. Whereas the first are exemplary of the kind of power wielded by religious community on account of the amount of money generated by pilgrimage, as well as the different intention and expectation that uh, were driving the devotees, the latter, so the pilgrimage that were uh, performed in India and Nepal, offer a glimpse of the development of new kinds of pilgrimage rituals, as well as the emergence of a form of spiritual tourism. And this is clear in the narrative, where we see that exoticism is seeping through, and uh, in the journey, uh, sorry, and the journal becomes more and more a sort of, you know, travelogue. For the sake of convenience, we can divide Zamyak's account into three major sections, or to use Brunner's definition, turning points. The first turning point that goes from 1944 to, 1950, uh, to 1945 corresponds to the author's acceptance of his conditions. Forced to abandon his ancestral land after enduring a trial for treason, 
The dispossessed trader eventually renounced his claims to reinstatement and fully embraced his condition as a uh, Chok, uh, Chokmene as a, as a circumambulator without a uh, fixed direction of its goal. And he finds in the archetypical figure of the wandering pilgrim Milarepa a socially and culturally acceptable conception of uh, personhood to which he could conform. The second turning point that goes from 1946 to 1951 must be sought in the author's final acknowledgement of the possibility of returning to his ancestral land. So it's a sort of continuation of, um, of the first turning point. By taking the figure of Milarepa as his uh, ideological eye, the trader embarks on a journey that is both physical and spiritual. The appeasing effect of the second turning point is Zamyak's self-identification with Milarepa, and we can assume the um, relief of finding um, a person or to whom it could conform is just you know, um, very short and in lasting. Despite his best intention, in fact, the traders struggle to hold up with the detached or the worldly attitude that is traditionally expected from our hermits and renunciates. Most of the religious activities performed by the traders up to 1952 sought among them results, good health, financial security, social stability. He was very much concerned about his place in the world and you know, how he could make it out there. He might have donned the humble robe of the pilgrim, yet his status as trader differed from that of the average Nekova. His socioeconomic condition and his familiarity with influential Eastern Tibetan merchants gave him the unique chance to directly interact with masters and reincarnates, requesting divinations, private meetings, and blessings from them. As I described in the, in the Nindeb as pilgrimages, Zamyak's visit to the sacred place of both Tibet and India were also incidental to planned business trips and on such subject to strict schedules and predetermined itineraries. Whereas the author provides an account that is based on truth, that is to say facts, his recollection is not totally truthful since he consciously emphasized the spiritual aspect of the journey, dismissing the actual motivation behind it. It is therefore in the identification with the great saint that the reconstructive reimaginative process is at its finest. With the narrated self being to all intent and purposes, a creation of the retrospective reflection of the narrating self. After all, as in any autobiographical narrative, there is in the Nindab a desire to resolve ambiguity, to give a sense to one's own life. By reinterpreting the facts in the light of the cultural and social expectations, the text becomes a testimony to the author's spiritual growth. It is uh, the intention to transform worldly constraints into merit-making opportunity, uh, opportunities. And we see here uh, some similarities with uh, Situ Panchen's diaries and his desire to collocate himself, to locate himself within a tradition of Lhotsawas. The third turning point in the Nindep that covers the last years, the 1952-1956, uh, coincides with his appointment as a trade agent for the Council Labrang of the Sakya establishment on Ingor Ewar Chodin, an event that goes almost unnoticed unless among the endless listing of ritual activities and empowerments received by the author in the same period. The Water Dragon Year 1952 marks the end of the author's incapacity to reconcile material and mundane needs with soteriological and spiritual desires. The inner splits caused by the forced coexistence of conflicting behavior and models, namely on one hand, the wandering pilgrim, the hermit, and on the other, the trader, is reconciled and overcome. At the end of the five month stay at No and One to Then, Zamyaks is a different man. By an active participation in the oral transmission of the laundry system by Dampa Rinpoche, the trader, according to his own self understanding and self representation, realized the fundamental unity of samsara and nirvana. The qualities of Buddha that he uh, thought was, uh, were outside himself were actually already present inside him and can be obtained through the removal of obscuration and transformation of one's own body, body speech and mind. So liberation is within himself. Less and less interested in mundane gain, Zanyak shifts his concern towards the afterlife and the accumulation of merits for the sake of all beings. I have started questioning the inclusion of the Nindep into the diary genre by analyzing the strictly autobiographical feature of the text and the inescapability of the Namta narrative, and therefore the need to bring into any literary analysis of the author, um, into any literary analysis, the author world and the, its place into it. 
This particular, this is particularly true as we have seen in the case of Zamiak's uh, NINDAP, an autobiographical account that plays itself within a complex intertextual network. The thickness of layers, socioeconomic constraints, cultural expectation, personal attachments, all endow pure imaginative elements from the aspirational identification with a yogin to the magical displays at the death of a Buddhist master, a strong component of cultural and religious truth. I would like to conclude with a reference to Ernest Hemingway, who in his preface to a movable, a movable feast said, and I'm here quoting, if the reader prefers, this book may be regarded as fiction, but there is always the chance that such a book of fiction may throw some light on what has been written as fact. A quote I reckon that perfectly fits Zamiak's mean depth as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gali. Um, okay, we, we already have one question coming in and I encourage the viewers to uh, type their questions here, but, but I will exercise the privilege of being the moderator and ask a few questions myself just to, to get things started. And, and I should say, don't feel obliged to answer all these now. Um, some of them are just observations because you have this really rich source and you know, aside from this person being not, you know, not an aristocrat, not a llama, he's from an area that is unusual to have records from. Yeah. Kind of right in the middle of Tibet or the Tibetan cultural region, right? In Nangchen. Um, so I thought it was I, I kind of pay a lot of attention to geographic terms. And I know that uh, Evelyn Washville has has thought about these a lot as well um, in, in her research. So the 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 thing I mean some of the, the things I thought were interesting was that there was that the, the I think his teacher said you know go on a pilgrimage without particular direction, yes. and then he says you know basically go southwest go to <laughs> that, right I mean Ngari and uh, that. and I thought that was kind of interesting because you know obviously he could go to Dege I mean he did of go course, to Dege yeah. and so yes. forth but like no direction definitely did not mean you know, Mongolia or China. No, not at all. Or, or, or even Amdo, which was so close, right? Yes. I mean, it's really close to Amdo. Um, and then later, um, he says he wandered through the three provinces of Tibet. And this in particular is something that Evelyn and I have spent a lot of time talking about, like what, and, and I like to pay attention to what these three provinces mean because it shifts so much over time. So I don't know if you know if this means Ngari, U, and Sang or Ngari, Utsang as a as one and Kam as the third, um, or did he ever go to Tibet? Um, I mean to Amdo, and and could this mean Utsang, Kam and Amdo, which is what we usually think of in this later period? Yes, I believe I believe so. He never went to uh, Amdo, uh, but uh, I believe that what he refers to was Nari, Utsang, and uh, Dome. So um, yes, the, the region of Eastern Tibet. Mm. And it was also very well traveled and you know, also well read. So definitely he was aware of all the kind of ideas uh, in terms also of geography that were circulating at the time. Yeah, so I wonder, you know, I wonder if Dutu and D Dome came up as a, a kind of separate uh, separate categories but anyway i can talk with you about that later or just look at the account since it's yeah. <laughs> um and then the last one on this kind of geographic references was the the idea that um i don't think it was printed in your slide nine but when you read out the the full text i think he said having wandered to the borders i arrived in U. yes which is really which is fascinating right, <laughs> right? <Yeah. laughs> because U means the center um, and certainly culturally, it's been taken as the center, but but he feels that's the borders, at least. In yeah, his to me, it's, it's very fascinating and very, you know, uh, thought provoking because I've been dealing a lot with ideas of borderlands and the periphery and the center and how it changes according to the way you are placed. And I believe that for people who are in the peripheries, actually the periphery is the center. So in a certain way, it makes sense for him to consider the central Tibet like the border from the way he, you know, he locates himself. So that, I mean, but, and, and he eventually goes beyond the borders, oh, right? It definitely so, goes beyond the border. So, it goes so even across the Himalayas, so. We talk about this a lot. I'm teaching a course in 20th century Tibet, and we talk about, you know, 
whether people thought of Tibet as a unit, right? As we do today, yeah. we so commonly refer to it as a unit. But if if when he gets to the borders, he's at ooh, then you know it's a really complicated thing. Um, uh, so anyway, that's I find that just really rich in your account. Um, the last thing, and and again, we can table this. More questions are coming in, but but I am really curious about what Tsongpun means. Um, I've run across this term in the Dome Chojong starting, I guess, back in, it sound, seems like some of these figures were almost in the Ming dynasty, early 1600s. And, um, and they're the ones who are welcoming the lamas who come from central Tibet to these communities where they eventually start monasteries in Amdo. Um, and I think Nicole Willock has talked a little bit about Tsongpun in, in the context of, of uh, Alexander, uh, the the uh, Tzedin Shapchong that she works with, but uh, but um, I, I'm you know I don't think it's a very well understood term in in uh, Tibetan uh, research. So I wonder yeah. if you could say a few few sentences about what it means. Uh, to for you. for what I understood from the way uh, it uses the term, because it's also uses for other people, um, other camper traders. Um, I believe it 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 refers to a sort of rank. Uh, Tsongpen is somebody that organizes caravans, so is in charge of people, muleteers, you know, and, and also organizing the, 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 the steps along the way and be certain that everything goes according to plan. And when he acted as a Tsongpen for uh, the council of Labrang, he said explicitly, I'm keeping a ledger of all the expenses and I need to show to the treasurer that what I do is correct. And it was in the one who had to organize the muleteers, who had to find the mule parks, who had to, you know, sort out all the stocks along the way and select what kind of commodities had to be sold and what kind had to be purchased. So I, I think in terms of organizational ability, they are much higher. Um, and and uh, it's quite common to, to have them in uh, relation to Kampa traders. And I think it's because they come from a... Um, a kind of trading network that is so organized. And when you start, you know, looking into families such as the Sadutsang or the Pandutsang, you really see that they had a structure that was based on a clan structure. And so, uh, of course, it was not democratic, but they had um, discussion among themselves and they had bases in Lhasa and Shigatse and uh, going towards, towards Kam as well. So you really had to have people who could take care of um, the big, uh, the big caravan, and I had this kind of discussion when I was in Oxford because I stressed how pilgrimage were somewhat incidental to business trips, and uh, of course I had people coming to me and say, well, you know, business is always connected to pilgrimage. You have peddlers going around, and you know, and they go to a pilgrimage, but they also buy stuff and sell stuff, and you have markets there. And I said, of course. But this is not what Zamyak is. Zamyak is a tsongpan, so he is organizing caravans. He has a huge responsibilities. And he said many times, I couldn't not go there because I had like 100 mules with me. And, you know, that person was waiting for me to, to deliver his goods. Um, so I, I really believe that there is this um, tension in himself because he wants to... Uh, somewhat be free on mundane, you know, restraints, but at the same time, he, he knows that he can't because he needs money and he needs, it also has a lot of, you know, commitments with other people. So do you think of it as a kind of rank or official position? I think it can be a, 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 um, an official position and it's often used in terms, um, in connection with uh, Labran. So um, the Tsongpon is usually a trade agent for a monastic institution. Um, and of course, that also uh, entails a lot of questions regarding how uh, monasteries, were, which were actually the banks in Tibet, were using the money and who was in charge, you know, and who was delivering the things. And I think the Tsongpong were really the, the people to go to, not yeah. simple merchants. They were people with connections. Right. I mean, you think about the word trade agent, you immediately start thinking about the British capitalists, right? Yes, <laughs> that, that's, that's and, true. And that's we're true. just not used to thinking about Tibetans having playing this kind of role or, in, you know, especially recording it. I yes, mean, we sort I, of know that they did, but... Maybe more than capitalism, I would say it was a matter of organization. So Bell, of course, you know, in uh, Peoples of Tibet, he said every Tibetan is a born trader. Of course it is, but 
the level of organization and the connection that you need. And, and it's very interesting also in terms of um, when we're talking about, you know, uh, the idea of peripheries and borders and center and stuff like this, that when it goes to India, uh, Tanyak and his uh, friends who are all campers, they travel within camper bubbles. So they go to Kalimpong, but they stay within their own friends. They have their own interpreters. And so there is a sort of disconnection, I think. We tend to believe that Tibet is a, this kind of monolithic uh, um, concept, but it was definitely not. And, and so um, this, this, I think there is also a, a great uh, deal of uh, national, I don't want to say nationalism, but you know the idea that you are connected to your land, and the fact that it comes from Ga is uh, important because when it goes to uh, Norewan Choden, which is a sake establishment, and it was a Gelu, uh, still there were many Kampa from Ga there, and and so again this kind of you know ethnic affiliation that is so strong, this kind of you know magnets that attract people coming from the same region. That's great. Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Um, so the, the first question we had was from Dagmar Schwerk. Uh, Hi, Dagmar. Who, <laughs> um, it's in the Q&A if you want to look at it, but I'll just read it aloud for, for everyone. Yes. Uh, she mentions that she's working on uh, the ninth chief abbot of Bhutan, Shaki Renshin, um, and, and a complex set of life writings. And the question is about the trope of humility that, that Buddhist masters use found in the statement of intent and the aspect of social validation of the writings. Um, and she says, it, as I find it sometimes difficult to evaluate this because it's such a standard thing to say, like it's a trope, right? Mm -hmm. and the opposite of the Nyumpa type of writing as well. So to deduct any personal intention is sometimes a little bit tricky here. So she's interested in how you feel about this and what other thoughts you have about this rhetorical trope when you, as you get to know an author in the transaction translation process. Hmm. That's a very interesting question. Thank you, Dagmar. Um, I agree with you. Um, of course, this kind of self-effacing uh, attitude becomes um, normative. So it is expected within the genre. And as I said, it's very difficult to escape this overarching Namta, you know, matrix um, and all kinds of um, textual production that deal with the self are somewhat expected to conform to certain expectation, cultural expectations. It's, as you said, it's hard to um, find, you know, to draw the line between what is, um, what is normative and so expected and what is felt. And I believe this is something that you can, um, you can get into only knowing the author. And in my case, I was very lucky because, of course, it's it's a, a personal annotation, so it's not an amta. There is not that kind of formality within it, and you can really feel Tanyak. I believe it's sincere uh, in its desire to, you know, be as close as possible to Milarepa, and but is also a realist, so he knows that that cannot happen, of course. And and so you you have all this kind of little notes here and there where he, you know, he refers to, oh, yes, I did this on the side, you know, I had some things to buy and some things to sell, and I had some debts to clear, but then I went and I did a lot of circumambulations. So the, the desire is there, but then there is the reality of, of the situation, which is, of course, different. Um, yes, I, I, I think that in, in, in this sense, we can talk about social validation of writing as a normative view, something that must be absolved. It's like when you read uh, official correspondence and you have a set of you know, phrases and sentences that must be somewhat respected because they are expected from the genre. And then you can go into the, the real thing. Um, I hope this answers your question. But as, as you said, it's very, very difficult to um, establish what is standard and what is felt. Great, thank you so much. You. And then the next question is from Marc Desjardins. Um, in the writer's diary, was there a particular place where he seemed to have experienced some sort of epiphany or defining moment that he recognized as the most memorable of his life? Does he describe the scenery and his state of mind? Um, Mark's curious to know what, to what extent the writer expressed his most vivid impressions. Oh, yes, um, there is, um, there are quite a few of them, um, but there is one that is very, 
peculiar and I think it was really funny. Um, I'm sorry for Zanyag because it was not funny for him. It, it was a very, at the very beginning um, when uh, he was still struggling with uh, his desire to reconcile himself with the Lord of Rabshi. So, you know, he, he wandered around, he kept himself quite close, but not never too close. And one of his friends were um, lords uh, in uh, local lords, and they hosted him. And he knew when he when he was there that there was um, a teaching uh, going on in a, a nearby valley, and he decided to go there, although he was suffering from rheumatic fever, and this is a condition that affects him quite a lot. And he was quite weak, but he decided to go in any case, and he went there and he listened to uh, the teachings. And of course, it was a memorable experience for him because you know it was, it was just amazing. So many people around, and you know the master was fantastic. And then it came time to go back home, and it was very very you know, weak. And uh, when the lady of the household sent him a servant and he said, okay, we're gonna, you know, uh, carry you, um, just relax and, and, uh, and be quiet. And he said, while we were, you know, climbing down the hill, something happened. I think the mule just got, you know, scared and he jumped me and I fell down the cliff and I broke two ribs. But then even though I was, you know, um, stuck in bed for three months and I was in excruciating pain, I just thought about all the delightful teachings that I received and I, you know, I was just happy about it. So you see, there, he, there are certain moments when he experienced small epiphanies here and there. And also, um, it's very interesting when he in, engaged in intertextual dialogues, he reads a lot. Uh, everywhere he goes, he asks for, you know, text. If he knows that somebody there has a text, he starts reading and he also records what he's, what he's reading, his impressions. And also when he goes to Kailash, he reports all the, you know, issues that are around uh, the legitimacy of considering Kailash in Nari and uh, uh, all the discussion that were carried out uh, by Sake et cetera, et cetera. So he's a very well-read individual. Great. Thank you. And, and then Jenna Gazzo says, thank you for a fascinating account of uh, this, this document. Uh, she's thinking about the distinction between textual self-construction and the parameters and influence on writing of a particular literary genre and worries a bit about saying too much in general about the need to, mm -hmm. or need to label as, as genres as such. Um, noting rather that uh, she thinks different kinds of writing may be given an array of labels, but their actual content and structures, the content and structure and conventions vary widely. Um, in other words, you know, the, she doesn't think there's too much we can say in general about Nintep since it varies so widely. And she gives the example of the labels, the Chiwe Namtar yeah. and the Sanwe Namtar. Um, but uh, notes that she found a lot of great interest in, uh, or a, uh, yeah, yeah, a lot of great interest in your analysis of the self-construction of this person, but less convinced by the role of genre as such. I don't know if you want to respond. Oh yes, uh, thank you, Janet. Thank you so much for you know uh, for your question. I agree with you, and I think this is um, this is a big problem when we talk about uh, literary genre in uh, in Tibet in Tibetan literary corpus because we find difficult to um, to place. Uh, text within specific categories. We can try, but it's of course never satisfactory. So um, I totally agree with you. Um, I stress it a bit too much, but also because it was for, for, for a kind of functionality of the talk, you know, I needed to place the Nindep or Ninto somewhere. And the closest thing that I could find was the diaristic genre, but it's of course not uh, a satisfactory uh, definition. And this is why I kept using air quotes. Um, and I thank you for, for your reference, and I will certainly go on and read more about fact versus fiction. I talked a bit um, about this um, distinction between fact and fiction, but then for time constraints, I decided just, you know, to, to keep cutting out of, of the talk. And so when I made some reference about fact and fiction, I'm afraid it might have been a bit confusing, but definitely, thank you so much. And then... Uh... Lara Wolf from Mount Holyoke is writing in to thank you for your talk and also uh, note, noted the place where you mentioned that personal annotations of relevant events contributes to the creation of a common memory and identity. And she asked that you elaborate on the social functions 
of diary writing in Tibet. Okay, so um, talking about uh, diary writing in Tibet, um, if we are talking about tradition is not super easy, um, as um, Janet Gyatsum herself uh, said, it's, it's difficult to define the genre. So we found snap, uh, snippets here and there that are usually encapsulating within other texts that are easy, easier to, uh, to define, like, you know, Namtars. But I believe that uh, personal annotation, especially of the kind um, that I described today, that are, were done by someone who didn't have a position within the government or it was not um, a lama, it's very interesting because it creates, as I said, a sort of identity for the family. And I mean, if you think about your own grandparents, they might have left correspondence or diaries and they allow you to uh, retrace back your own genealogy. And I think this is very important and also to create a connection and, and also stress again and again, what are the social um, elements that are considered important. So for um, the, the nephews, for instance, of Zamyang, it was clear that for their uncle, uh, it was you know, very important to be as close as possible as Milarepa as a model. Um, so yeah, I believe that personal annotation in general are really an interesting point to start reflecting on the creation of common memories uh, within private family units, but also uh, more generally in larger communities. Thank you. And then Learned Foot uh, also thanks you for the talk and says that uh, they thought your fact fiction comments on visions were particularly nuanced and helpful. And those they're translating an autobiography of Kampa Lama, who lived from 1842 to 1924. Uh, and though Western scholar decades ago saw these visions as meaning the work was ahistorical, uh, they've been struck by how the visions are often bound up in social practices or sometimes occurring in relation to social conflicts. Could you say more about how the visionary and social political dimensions could be related? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, so I, uh, in the case of Zamyang, I cannot say that they were connected to specific events for this, because they were connected mostly with um, either teachings, uh, but more specifically with the death of important masters. Uh, and again, this is quite um, expected and uh, it, it falls within you know, the normative expectations. Um, but I, I believe that this is a very, very good point. And uh, definitely I will not take them as historical uh, per se, because they usually occur in specific, you know, and in pivotal uh, moments. So it, it doesn't surprise me they are uh, connected or occurring in, in relation to social conflicts. But in my case, I cannot elaborate any further just because the visions that occurred, they're always connected to you know, uh, the death of a master and he's never experiencing them himself. He reports what people are saying. So um, again, the importance of oral accounts and oral narratives. Great, thank you. And Sonam Norbo asks, was the Tsongkhan a monk for his whole life or uh, how long was he a monk during his life? So that's an interesting point. Um, I, I cannot answer uh, in a very specific way, but I believe that he kept his vows till the end. Um, and uh, he was never married, we know that for certain. And um, it was also at the time of his death because he died in 1961 and he was uh, in, in India at the time. Uh, many monks attended this um, ceremony and there were, of course, uh, visions and rainbows and all kinds of wonderful and auspicious, auspicious things that happened. And he was renowned as a Rime uh, practitioner. Um, so I believe that he preserved his, uh, his vows till the very end. Great. Thank you. I, Thank I, didn't, you. I was not aware of that. <laughs> I guess the hearing your talk, I didn't sort of think through that, that reality. Um, well, if again, if anyone has more questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A section. I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit more. The other class I'm teaching this semester is about life writing. And mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Janet's talked about these kind of records that that uh, these diary records in, in some of her articles. But what's your sense of 
you know, for the contemporary period, for instance, do you have a sense that there are many more of these that maybe were written? Uh, do, do people talk about these things? How, you know, oh, my uncle had one of these, but, you know, it got lost or is this really as exceptional as it seems? I, I don't believe I don't believe it's exceptional. Um, I, I believe the people kept diaries. Um, they might have not been very straightforward uh, regarding writing them. And um, I mean, it makes it makes sense if it was a private annotation, you don't want to share it with many others. Uh, but I don't think it was anything exceptional at all. Um, when I wrote the article that is uh, in, in the collection that we edited um, and is now out, it was out last, last year, I um, kind of follow up uh, the use of diaries also in literature in, you know, in, uh, in the 80s. And then again, a sort of resurgent with all the blogs that you see around now. And um, I, I believe that there is a tendency to write uh, I mean, Tibetans loved writing and they loved kept annotations and maybe they just didn't think that it was, you know, worthwhile sharing them, but I believe that they, they kept them. It's, it's just, you know, I, it's fascinating to think about the private archives, who knows what's inside them. So you, you haven't seen or heard of other of no. these that are held by individual families? No. Yeah. No, I did not. Well, since no one else is asking questions, I, I'll, I'll return to my Amdo questions because I'm so I'm so intrigued by the fact that this this you know merchant official this this uh, this agent uh, trade agent lived so close to Amdo and yet went so far south. Yes, <laughs> dying there. Um, I have a, a, a graduate student here who's writing about the the expansion of trade up onto the Tibetan plateau in just this period, right? So. The the you know Jim Millward, Millward has written about this that the that the Muslim merchants on the eastern frontier of Tibet started to sort of reach farther and farther into the grasslands of Amdo um, in pursuit especially of wool, wool to feed yeah. the the growing you yeah. know international wool trade and that it would be brought to Xining and then it would go down river and go on the the Yellow River all the way down to Tianjin and and you know be connected to the world. And, and we can see clear impacts of this, you know, in Amdo, because the monasteries that were just tent monasteries in, in, in the past, in, in the late 19th century, early 20th centuries, they start building, you know, they start being able to afford to haul wood up from, you know, wherever the wood is far away. And he lived so close to that area. It's just intriguing to me that he did, never went that direction. Do you have a sense that that was just his own trajectory? Or do you have more of a sense of the trajectory of like, I have, trade agents in general? My idea is um, we need to think with his own head, although it's quite difficult. Um, it was basically lost. So what he needed were friends. And mm -hmm. since he had a connection with the Sadatsang and the Sadatsang were all projected towards central Tibet and from Tibet towards India, I think it was just natural for him to you know, go where he could find some kind of support. And so he went to Lhasa first, and then he just stopped in Shigatse. And he said that he was, you know, hosted by one of the Sadutsan there. So to me, uh, he said that he was going into a pilgrimage that had no direction. But of course, there was a direction. The direction was safety for him. And safety was where his friends were. And especially because it was, it, it is said, uh, it is said only once that he received threats. So it, it was very clear to him that he had to vacate Rabshi, he had to go away. And he never went back, never once. Lok Jung, one of his um, nephew, he was his referent for all the transaction that had um, you know, come in, in, uh, in there uh, as final destination. He never went there and, you know, anymore. So I think what he, what he, what he followed was uh, um, a route that he knew because he had been before there, he had friends there, and he was comfortable there. Okay. And I mean, it makes sense. He, he was sick. It was, uh, you know, it was not in great health. He was 49, and he was just, you know, scared for his life. Yeah. Okay. Can you talk a little bit also about the, the material that was, that he helped move? What, what were the material and what was the kind of final market? Was he aware of the final destination for these products or was he kind of just a middleman who did his job and didn't think so about prices? He, 
the the um, the venture it was mainly involved with was uh, from uh, um, Shigatsu to uh, Kalimpong. Unfortunately, it doesn't specify what kind of commodities uh, it was dealing with. It just said that he received a caravan worth of 15,000 rupees at the time and he had to deal with it. It doesn't explain if it was you know, um, exporting things, if it was importing things. Well, we can imagine that it was both. Uh, so he probably uh, transported wool and then he came back with, I don't know, cotton textiles most probably and um, back to Shigatsu. But he also did some kind of, you know, um, um, small or medium length tra trade within the plateau. So it was not unusual for him to go towards Nari and then coming back to Lhasa and, you know, taking uh, uh, charge of the caravans over there. Yeah, great. Uh, Sonam Norbu is also asking, is this the same question? It looks like the same question. Uh, it's so tiny. Yeah, it's super tiny. <laughs> okay. I think Lauren may have translated it for us while we were talking. Uh, or no, maybe this is Lauren's own question. Well, let's, let's go to this while we're, while we're trying to, I'm going to have to copy uh, Sanam's text into a larger field. Um, but Lauren asks, you observe that the diary is not a confessional, uh, as is not confessional, uh, as is sometimes the case among aristocrats, we do see autobiographical materials that seem to present the self in various ways as a faithful servant of the Gan and for example. Aside from the alignment or comparison with Miller Ip in part two, do you sense any commentary or construction uh, in part three? Oh, okay. So um, definitely, thank you, Lauren. Uh, definitely, um, it is not confessional in the sense that um, it doesn't reveal much about himself. Um, as for the aristocrats, I'm not certain that we can say that the um, autobiographies were confessional. Uh, they absorb some sort of, um, of um, goal, and that goal was to uh, introduce themselves and you know to reiterate their status and be certain that their status was not challenged. In some cases, they also promoted their families, and and so uh, I wouldn't say they were confessional. There was always this kind of you know idea to which you uh, kind of approach yourself towards. Um, as for the alignment commentary in, in, in part three, no, I would say that this is a kind of um, epiphany moment, if, if you will, in the sense that Zamyang is really understand that um, there is not uh, conf conflict, as he used to see, between the samsara and the nirvana, because you already have within yourself all you need to become a bodhisattva. So his idea that he was wasting his life because he was pursuing, you know, mundane results when he had to cleanse his karma, it's no longer there and is very much more relaxed. And I believe that is also because it doesn't have any kind of financial in, uh, insecurity any longer because he had you know, a position, or a firm position at some point for, for the Labran. And he could use the money that he finally had for commissioning all kinds of offerings, all kinds of you know, ritual ceremonies. And uh, uh, he just decided to dedicate himself to the religious life. And so all the kind of conflict that you, you felt is no longer there. And I think it's because the kind of money that he had was no longer needed to him for his survival. And so he didn't feel guilty about, you know, actively pursuing it. The money that he had right now was just, you know, funneled towards ritual activities. It was no longer polluting, so to speak. Um, yeah, and and uh, some of them uh, Norbo had said thank you for your earlier answer and, mm -hmm. and then uh, posted here in the in the chat uh, that the what is the earliest diary you've encountered, for example, is it the autobiography of the Fatah Lama? Um, or yes. Is there, yeah, it yes, is. That's, that's, that is. Yeah, it is that one. Um, and then finally, I think um, uh, Bhargavi uh, who is an in incoming graduate student, incoming doctoral student here at Columbia, uh, uh, says that she prepares for grad school. It'd be helpful if you could share your research me methodology while uh, approaching these diary texts. So what, what was your approach to, to So um, 
as I mentioned briefly in one of the slides, um, what I used was a mixture between narratology and um, social historical analysis. Um, I believe though, as uh, Janet Gyatso mentioned before, I mean, we need to be extra careful when we use, you know, um, tools that were produced within the Western environment for Western literature, and then, you know, simply superimposing them on other cultural productions. And, and so, um, although I was satisfied, mildly satisfied with the kind of approach that I used, there are certain gaps. And of course, there are things that needs to be uh, carefully uh, revise and, and tweak when, when you use any kind of um, structure that was created in a Western environment to deal with a cultural production that comes from somewhere else. But anyway, I have my, um, I left my email somewhere. Uh, if, if you want to, sh you know, contact me, you can do it and we can talk about it uh, at any time. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you also just for your generosity. I know that you're very busy there at the Institute. Oh, no, no, Advanced that's Studies. absolutely fine. I'm very happy about it. Yeah. And we've Thank been you. delighted to have you here today. And uh, I, I'm just checking one last time to see it looked like there were two more messages to two more questions, but but um, I think that's it. And we will Thank you and, and let you go to enjoy the, the snow and ice that is covering everything here in New Jersey. And oh no, my... here is snowing. Uh, sorry, is it raining? Just oh, it's raining, raining in your yes. part. It's, it's uh, <laughs> just, just 30 miles north here in New Jersey. It's everything's covered in ice and snow. Um, and I, I hear the same as in New York. So um, thanks so much for everyone. Thank you so much, actually. It was, it was wonderful. And thank you all for coming. Have a lovely day. Bye thanks. Bye. Thanks also. I wanted to thank Lauren Hartley for. Oh yes, absolutely. Thank you, Lauren. You you've been fantastic. Thank you so much. All right. <laughs> See care. you. Bye bye. Yeah, bye bye.